Hi, my name is Dr. Serena H. Chen, uh, and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Serena H. Chen. I am the Director of Reproductive Medicine at uh, St. Barnabas Medical Center in Livingston, New Jersey, and the Institute for Reproductive Medicine and Science, IRMS. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist. I'm a physician. I treat couples with infertility, help cancer patients freeze their eggs before they go through cancer treatment to preserve their fertility. Also, transgender males freeze their eggs. I help single people and LGBTQ people with assisted reproductive technologies like donor sperm, donor egg, and in vitro fertilization. And the title of my talk is The End of Sex for Human Reproduction. Now, I am at the Women of Sex Tech virtual conference and it's been a phenomenal experience. This is not the live talk because I couldn't figure out how to record myself. So I'm recording this later after having seen the whole conference. It was amazing. So I would encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to watch all the videos because so many uh, sexual freedom warriors here. And uh, I'm a huge advocate for reproductive health, reproductive wellness, sexual wellness, and sexual freedom, and reproductive freedom. And that's why I'm here today, because I think that all of us as global citizens need to understand assisted reproductive technology. So I'm not talking about ending sex for pleasure. I'm talking about the end of sex for human reproduction because it's possible as IVF and pre-implantation genetic testing and genetic uh, editing with things like CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R and other tools, um, as these technologies become more and more accessible, less and less expensive, more cost-effective, we're gonna start seeing the use for people other than uh, my typical patients. My patients suffer from the disease of infertility or they're in a segment of the population like single people and LGBTQ that need assistance in order to conceive. They cannot conceive any other way. But people who can conceive on their own uh, don't usually see me, but what if this technology was cheaper and easier and more accessible um, than it is today? It might be much less risky to conceive this way than it would be to conceive naturally with intercourse. For example, miscarriages. Right now today, um, all fertile people, normal fertile people, the rate of miscarriage is actually quite high. Mother Nature uses this to prevent birth defects, but it causes a tremendous amount of loss and suffering. Women process uh, a miscarriage, and men too, their partners too, can process a, a miscarriage just like the death of a loved one. But there's a lot more secrecy and shame surrounding miscarriage, so it's not talked about very much. The normal rate of miscarriage in a fertile couple is one in four. It's very, very common. And right now today, if you let me do IVF to help you conceive uh, and make embryos and do genetic testing and eliminate chromosomal abnormalities, which cause most miscarriages, I would get you a one in 10 miscarriage rate, which is obviously much better. So if it was super duper easy, it was not a big deal, it didn't cost a lot of money, uh, it didn't take a lot of time to do this, wouldn't you choose a one in 10 miscarriage rate over a one in four miscarriage rate? What if in a few years we get a lot better and it's a one in 100 miscarriage rate instead of a one in four miscarriage rate? Um, then if the technology was very easy and accessible and affordable, then wouldn't a lot of people choose to conceive that way maybe instead of choosing to conceive on their own? So that's what I mean. This technology is moving forward at a very rapid pace. We are able to reduce the risk of disease. We're able to eliminate suffering. Um, we're able to promote wellness, uh, reproductive wellness. So as this technology becomes 
better and better and more and more widespread, more accessible, less expensive, um, maybe we will see wider and wider use. And so people who don't have to use this technology may want to use this technology. There's another aspect this is to this technology that I think is very, very important. And that is the increasing ability to move towards selection of genetic traits. Number one is sex selection. We're doing sex selection today. Sex selection in the United States is not such a terrible thing because most of the time it's people with infertility who need IVF anyway to conceive. They do the genetic testing to reduce their risk for miscarriage. They have both XX and XY embryos. Maybe they have an XY child at home and they say, you know, let's put in the XX embryo first. And that's called family balancing. So they are not using this technology only to select sex, but they have to use the technology anyway to help lower their risks and they want to balance their family. So that it's not a situation of sex bias. Now we know sex selection for reasons of sex discrimination and sex bias are occurring today in the world and not through this uh, pre-implantation genetic testing, IVF technology, IVF PGT technology. It's occurring through things like infanticide. That's, inc that's occurred since the beginning of time, neglect of female children, and also abortion of female fetuses, so or XX fetuses. So uh, we know this is occurring today. In fact, there are certain populations, maybe certain parts of India, for example, that have um, used, the, used their ability to do sex selection to such an extent that they've actually changed the sex ratio, many, many more males in their population than females, to the point where young males cannot find partners and, um, and to the point where it's actually um, increased violence against women. So the WHO has come out against sex selection uh, for sex bias reasons, saying it strongly correlated that changing the sex ratio is strongly correlated against uh, with um, violence against women. So sex selection for cultural and social reasons uh, in those societies have actually had significant negative unintended consequences. So uh, parents wanting to do the best thing by their child have, or by their family, have actually created huge negative ramifications in society. And that's, that's what I'm concerned about. Could this technology, which is designed to prevent suffering, to prevent disease, uh, to promote health and wellness, uh, could it be used uh, for other things that are not so good? Could it, or could it have unintended consequences? Um, I always tell my parents or my intended parents that ask for the XX embryo for, to be transferred first, I say, you know, you have to think about what does that mean uh, when you choose that? What kind of burdens are you placing upon this future, the future of this potential child? Um, are you thinking XX means a, a little girl wearing pink? Um, what, if, what if your little girl doesn't wanna wear pink? What if your XX embryo actually is a transgender male. What about that? You know, will you still love that child? Will that still be okay? You have to think about those things when you make these kinds of decisions. Um, do you really wanna make that decision? You know, is that really a decision you wanna make? So um, maybe we should just put back the healthiest embryo. Um, let the lab choose arbitrarily using scientific criteria. Um, those are things we, we really need to think about. Uh, I think about, I have mixed feelings about this technology because we're, right now we use this technology to prevent things like Tay-Sachs, muscular dystrophy, uh, cystic fibrosis, really severe, terrible, debilitating diseases because we can take a high-risk couple where say they both, both partners carry the Tay-Sachs gene, but they're perfectly healthy and yet they have a super high risk of having a child with a terrible, 100% lethal disease that causes huge suffering before uh, death in the child. And, and people wanna prevent that. So 
they do I they try not to conceive on their own they do IVF we take eggs and sperm we put the eggs and sperm together we make the embryos we choose the healthy embryo the one without disease uh, to go back um, but what if we could check for many more characteristics and we're starting to be able to do that now things like not like severe diseases things like height things like intelligence what will that mean to the child what will that mean to the family what will that mean for the society i have very mixed feelings about this so you can't tell this but i'm barely five feet tall okay and um i think about my mom my i'm the first child my mom if she had this technology before i was born she had access to this tech this technology i might not be here i don't think she would have chosen the short loud embryo. I think she would have chosen the tall, quiet embryo. My name is Serena. That means peaceful beauty. I am not peaceful. I'm very loud. So I don't think I would be here, okay, with this technology. So um, I have very mixed feelings. And you can see how this can quickly go from promoting health and wellness to honestly trying to make the human race better. Um, should we be doing that? Uh, let's let's talk about that. So please follow me on Twitter and Instagram, DR for Dr. Serena, like Serena Williams, S-E-R-E-N-A-H Chen, C-H-E-N, on Twitter and Instagram. We need to talk about this more. As global citizens, I want everyone to know the power of this technology, the power of this technology for good and for potentially not so good. We need to talk about it. We need to make decisions about how this technology is used and everybody, all of the human race should participate in that dialogue, not just the scientists and the physicians. So please connect with me. Thank you for coming to this conference and I'm so honored to be here. Have a great day. Stay safe.